going to be a lecture on the gold standard, as I said before, which uh, has to do with our money system, the money that we use, how our banks work. It's really sort of the foundation of our economy, how our economy works in the West uh, under a free market system. So that's what the lecture is going to be getting into, and I'll get into that in a second. without having to raise taxes for it. The number one being war. Um, our country has gotten into two major wars and several minor wars throughout the 20th century. World, uh, well, obviously I'm talking about World War I and World War II. And as you'll see, both of those wars were not a result of, but were only possible because Canada moved on to, moved from a system where we use gold as our money move towards a system where the government could print paper dollars and we would have to use them as money. Uh, and the federal debt, um, this it, it gets a little more technical about it, the process of how that money is created. But um, the bottom line is that because the banks can print money, which is what they do, that's uh, our system is called fractional reserve banking where banks take in loans, uh, sorry, banks take in deposits, when we go to the bank, we put in our money, put in this much, and the banks then loan out this much money. So what that means is, the banks have a tremendous amount of lending power, and that lending power is primarily being lent to government. Also through the uh, central banking process, which I'll also be getting into, the um, central government is accumulating a tremendous amount of debt, by their being able to print so much paper dollars, our government is partly borrowing those dollars and getting us into a deep debt. Uh, yeah, the next problem is um, the rise of big business and how and pushing out small businesses in our economy. Um, the fact that our banks are large and that they're um, they have a tremendous amount of power because they precisely because they can make loans huge amounts of loans, they're loaning to the best possible um, returns for their money, and that's going to be loaning to government, and that's going to be loaning to corporations. Um, another problem is the boom-bust cycle. Because there's a central control of our money, because uh, our money can be printed by the government and by the banks, it can be controlled, it can be increased, it can be decreased. And that process of increase and decrease leads to employment and then unemployment. So you have something called the business cycle. So I want to just uh, kick off the issue with a, t with, uh, a brief video that um, gives a, a brief introduction introduction to the issue from the public policy. The Federal Reserve System virtually controls the nation's monetary system. Yet it is accountable to no one. It has no budget. It is subject to no audit. And no congressional committee knows of or can truly supervise its operations. For more than 20 years, the living standards of middle class Americans have steadily declined. Incomes have remained flat or fallen, and the opportunities and security we once took for granted have begun to fade. For most families, one income no longer pays the bills. It requires two or more incomes to afford a home, pay medical and child care expenses, and put children through school. Unless present trends change, young workers are unlikely to ever live as well as their parents. Good jobs with the future are harder to come by. Education doesn't count for what it once did. Taxes continue to rise, while Social Security is going bankrupt.
private pensions are no longer reliable. Economic volatility and uncertainty are on the rise. Politicians espouse numerous theories about the cause of this country's economic woes. Seldom, however, do these officials look below the surface. The roots of our economic ills can be traced to central banking and our present monetary system. The Federal Reserve claims to manage our money. Instead, it makes our money worth less and less every day. It has generated continuous and worsening business cycles and lowered our living standards. It's really no different from a burglar in your house wanting to steal your money. That's what the Federal Reserve does. It, it depreciates your savings, it takes away your uh, economic security, and it ought to be treated as an institution that does that rather than something of a large benefit. Money is supposed to serve as a reliable standard of economic value, not a source of instability. Until we restore sound money and take away the government's ability to debase it, we have little hope of restoring the freedom and prosperity that made America great. And uh, we really have a choice of what we want in money. Do we want money that's going to be losing its value every year, or do we want money that's going to be gaining in value? If you are happy with your money losing value, then you want the present system. If you want money to increase in value, then you want a gold standard. What is money? As the good that makes exchange possible, it's the foundation of every economic activity. In 1792, Thomas Jefferson adopted the dollar as this country's official monetary unit. He looked around and investigated to see what were the American people using it for, and that was the dollar. And so that's why that, that dollar became the standard of the United States. And we went on to the gold and silver standard and started making gold coins with the American people. Jefferson, in particular, spoke eloquently of the dangers of paper money. During the War for Independence, the Continental Congress printed vast sums of paper money out of thin air to finance the army. The diluted money supply naturally depreciated to almost nothing, leading to the phrase, not worth a continental. The people who held on to these notes intended to be patriotic Americans concerned about wanted America to be free of British, uh, British control, lost everything. Whereas the Tories, who wanted nothing to do with this American government money, immediately got rid of it, uh, were benefited. Uh, and Pelletine and Webster, the first American economist, and others who looked at this, saw that this paper money, unbacked by, by gold, was extremely dangerous. As early as the 16th century in Europe, Goldsmiths stored gold coins for their customers for a fee and issued receipts for the gold to the depositor. Thus began the use of paper as money. In other words, if you came in and deposited 10 ounces of gold for safekeeping, you got back receipts in the amount of 10 gold ounces. And those receipts entitled you to instantaneously redeem that gold. These receipts soon became widely accepted as a means of exchange since it was easier and safer to use the receipts for significant transactions. This was the origin of banknotes as money substitutes. These first bankers then took this process one step further. In effect, uh, if the goldsmith had 1,000 ounces of gold and 1,000 ounces of legitimate receipts being held by the deposit of that gold, he could increase his profits by merely printing up another 1,000 ounces worth of receipts and lending them out in which case you would effectively get 50% reserve banking, or fractional reserve banking. Only a, a fraction, 50% of, of the receipts were now backed by gold. There was no longer a one-to-one -one ratio of paper to gold. Now there could be three or four pieces of paper in circulation for every unit of gold in the vault. These bankers were no longer simply storing or warehousing gold for a fee. They were artificially inflating the money supply and loaning out these phony receipts at interest. 